Okay, it's one o'clock. Time to start. We were talking about uh, shafting last time. Are there any questions or comments before we start? Okay. When we're talking about shafting, shafting is a big topic. Something we'll have to spend quite a bit of time on. I was telling some of the students before all of you arrived that the exam problem will take about two hours and 15 minutes to finish off. I'm going to break it up into parts, but basically you have to do a force and basically loading analysis first, which takes some time, and figure out the loading from all the different machine elements, and then the reactions at all the bearings, and then finally the shear and moment diagrams, and then finally calculate diameters. After you calculate diameters, you've included stress concentrations by that point, then you know what size the shaft has to be along its entire length. And when you know that, then you can finally actually size each, each section. You know what are the minimum diameters. So you don't calculate, say, the shaft needs a 2.536 inch diameter and find a bearing that has a bore of that diameter. You have to size it up to the next size that the bearing will actually fit on. If you buy the standard sizes. I told you guys I would find that shaft that's been floating around here. Here it is. It's, uh, if you notice, it's got a feature on the end, I think I showed this to you in strength and materials, where the end fatigued off. So you can see the fatigue cracking, you can see the final split at the middle. What I really want you to notice about this is that there are so many features on it. There's a keyway here. This is actually a Woodruff key, which we won't talk much about, at least not in shafts. This is a sled runner key on the end. There's a centering uh, hole there, probably they're holding one end of it as they machined it. You'll notice that some of the sections are fairly rough. You can hear that maybe, for the sake of the camera. It's got grooves on it. You wouldn't have any machine elements riding on that. It's just slightly smaller than this more polished section. And if you feel with your fingers, what you'll notice is that this section that's a little rough is smaller than this section. That way the machine element can slide all the way onto this section. This is where it would land, and then sit up against the shoulder. Now this shaft failed. I mean, there's probably some bad ideas for design on this. Here's a couple of bad ideas. If you look at the shoulders, these two shoulders that you can see, you'll notice that there's a relief or there's, there's cut in. It's, it's, it's made a smaller diameter here so that you don't end up with a, uh, a, sh a sharp shoulder, which you can't make anyway, but you don't end up with any radius. That's not really a good idea. What's a better idea is to put a machine element up against this shoulder that includes a chamfer on it so that you can accommodate a radius and reduce stress concentration. So these are large stress concentrations. Now, are they horrible? Is this a horrible design? Maybe not because honestly, this groove right here and this uh, uh, oil, not oil ring, but uh, O-ring groove is going to have very sharp edges and would probably cause just as much stress concentration as these, what I would say, poorly designed shoulders do. So I'll pass this around and let you guys look at it. Obviously, this one failed. Another feature you'll notice is there's a cross-drilled pin in this as well. And I can't tell if it's broken off or if that was just part of the manufacturing or what that was. I don't know what this came out of either. But this is the kind of shaft we're talking about designing in this chapter, where you have multiple different diameters along the length. You have multiple features along the length. And so it's, the shaft serves a very particular purpose. Now understand, we're not even talking about the most complicated shafts out there. Matter of fact, just for fun, because I've never really tried this before, I googled power transmission shaft before I started this class, just to see what I could find. Because really what we're talking about are shafts whose jobs are to transmit power from one location to another. And I um, found some things. Um, here's something more like what we're talking about. You see the multiple diameters along the leaf. There's some splines on the end. Engaging the shaft, there's some grooves here. I don't know what they're for. Um, you see a shaft here that carries multiple gears. There's a spur gear and a helical gear. Um, the helical gear set here and spur gear. This may be from a transmission. You ever notice uh, power tr or manual transmissions in a car? You ever notice when you go forward, the sound of the gears is pretty quiet. You don't hear anything. But when you put it in reverse, how many? Of you, uh, okay. Man, a manual transmission is the top where you have a gear shift and you have to shift, okay? Forgot the audience I'm talking to. Uh, <laughs> some of you probably know what I mean. But um, 
Anyway, the, the gearbox inside of a manual transmission, the forward gears are always helical gears. The reverse gears are spur gears, and that's why you hear a noise when you put it in reverse and back up. It's the, the, the teeth clatter a little bit more with spur gears, whereas with helical gears, the engagement across the width of the tooth is gradual. So anyway, somebody had their hand up. So, what were you going to say? Yeah, we're driving a 10 speed. A 10 speed bicycle? Oh, a 10 speed uh, vehicle? Yeah. I have not. How is that? 18 wheeler. Okay. Yeah, I understand you've got a couple, you have two clutches on those, right? Uh, kind of, it's kind of a two-stage clutch, but you got a, there's usually like a trigger for a low high on the, on the shifter. Okay. Sure, that's a totally different animal. I have nothing, you know, no experience with. I did drive an old pickup. I'll tell you guys this: when I was in high school, took all kinds of different jobs. One of them was uh, mowing grass, so I mowed grass. Most of the rich people's lawns in Louisville, I mowed. Uh, I also uh, worked with a guy, several different guys, doing construction work. So I was the gopher and the guy that went to clean up. So there's one old guy I was working with, real nice guy. He uh, he had this old bread truck. I mean, really old. This thing was a rattle truck. And our death trap really is what it was. It was by the time we were driving it, it was probably a good 60 years old. Maybe not quite that, but it seemed like it. Anyway, the gear shift instead of being on the floor was on the column. So you had to shift on the column and have four speeds. Well, I think maybe three speeds in reverse or something. That was quite interesting. There was one time I remember you guys probably weren't driving when we had the uh, the old bridge the way it was set up with just 65 north and south on the one bridge now that just serves south. But I remember one day we were coming in from the east end of Louisville to get on going north on 65. And this guy, I mean, I've never seen anybody drive. You think I drive bad? You should have seen this guy. He, he's, he's passed away now. But he, uh, not, from, not from a wreck. <laughs> it was old age. <laughs> I, when I was riding with him, I thought it was going to be from a wreck because traffic would stack up to go north. And, of course, everybody was at a standstill. Well, he was barreling, barreling along about 65 miles an hour right beside all these cars that were stopped. He saw an opening, and he just swerved right in, slammed on the brakes. I could not believe. I was shutting my eyes and holding on because I thought for sure we were going to wreck and die at that point. Uh, but we made it somehow. I don't know how that old truck held together, but it sure did. Anyway, so you were going to say something else. I'm sorry. Now, you, you pretty much went in the direction I was going. Uh, okay, okay. So anyway, um, we'll learn more about vehicle versus spurgers. But you can see that the shaft that carries these is a fairly simple shaft. Now you notice this keyhole here, and this is, this looks like a rendering sometimes, not a photo, obviously, but uh, the keyhole here means that there must be some main feature on the shaft for the key to ride, in other words, some slot. Now we're not going to get into enough theory where you can design something like this shaft, which is technically a power transmission shaft. It's a cam shaft. There's also, of course, crank shafts. If you've ever built an engine, you know what that looks like. We're not going to have tools in this chapter or in this class to help us design something like that. That's going to be outside of our uh, range. But uh, fairly simple shelves like these or this, uh, you should be able to design by the time you're done. Now, there are some features that I noticed on some of these shafts that you won't know how to design. Uh, where was that one? We will actually learn about splines a little bit later. Um, oh, this shaft here. You notice how there are these long, <coughs> Uh, cuts in the length of the shaft. We don't really have anything to describe the stress concentration that would cause, and so you won't know how to design this shaft, for example, by the time we go over this chapter. But I think you'll have learned quite a lot. Any other questions or comments before we go on? Last time we were talking about forces due to chains and belts, and I'll just remind you because we ran through this pretty quickly. With the chain, you have the tight side and the slack side, and what we're doing is we're assuming that all the force in the chain essentially ends up being along the center line and transmitted to the shafts. Similarly, a belt causes a force that we align along the two shafts, even though it's actually at an angle. And really, there's two forces because even the slack side has some tension. In it. And I pointed out that ideally you want the tight side to be about five times the force of the slack side. And if that's a properly tensioned belt, if your belt is tensioned to that level, then you can calculate the actual bending forces on the shaft by the equations that I show you in the text. All right, now, we will also talk about couplings a little bit later, and if you have a flexible coupling, ideally it doesn't transmit any force, any lateral force to the shaft, it would only transmit torque. And so, um, flexible couplings usually are not things that we worry about loading a shaft. 
Now, for keys, keys do cause stress concentration. You guys have been through me, through, not through me, you've been through strength materials with me, and you know what I mean when I say a stress concentration. Now, there's a lot more to this than what we're going to use, but to make things simple, because there's going to be plenty of complication, to make things simple, we're going to assume that all profile key seats have a stress concentration factor of 2, and all sled runner key seats have a stress concentration of 1.6. It's just some numbers we'll use to get through this chapter. In the real world, what matters is the radius at the root of the key seat. Does that make sense? That matters, and that does affect these two. But for right now, we're just going to use these because a, a key seat with a, the right radius or a decent radius will come out to about the stress concentration factor. So these are what we're going to use. You will want to note that. You may even want to highlight in your book. It's important enough I'm going to find it in chapter 12 and point it out to you. 458. 458, thank you. Yeah, 458, column 2, on the right, right above the picture that looks just like this. Those are two numbers worth highlighting if you highlight the book. Now that shaft that I'm passing around, if you notice, it has a couple different shoulders in it, right? Chain, large changes in diameter, which give a vertical face that a machine element can set up against. The radius at the root of that shoulder is important. In fact, you can even calculate or look up stress concentration factors on charts based on the radius versus the two diameters. So you can parameterize all this make a bunch of non-dimensional numbers and non-dimensional charts and come up with stress concentration factors for a wide variety of scenarios. However, for our case, to make this simple also, we're going to assume that either it is a so-called sharp shoulder, where the stress concentration factor is 2.5, or a well-rounded shoulder, where the stress concentration factor is 1.5. Now, we're going to assume that we won't put machine, well usually, we'll assume we're not going to put machine elements up against a shoulder that is well rounded because that would be a, an excessive cam, uh, chamfer on the machine element. We're going to assume that if we have a gear or a pulley or a bearing up against a shoulder that it is a sharp shoulder with a stress concentration factor of two and a half. Now this is also uh, on the same page you have your book open to or really 459 the facing page in the upper right hand side or upper right hand section of the column. I would suggest you highlight those two numbers as well because we'll use them quite a lot. The last thing to mention are grooves and I don't recall where your author has grooves. Oh, he doesn't have a picture for you. It's right below the factors you just highlighted on page 459. You may want to highlight this in the body of the text. It says retaining ring grooves You'll see the second paragraph says, for preliminary design, we will apply a stress concentration factor of three to grooves, essentially. So anytime you see a groove, whether it's a groove for an oil ring or a snap ring, or if it's a uh, O-ring groove, or even a groove in a spline shaft, we're going to assume the correct stress concentration factor is 3.0. Once you've got all of that, once you've analyzed the shaft as a beam so that you've got all of the loading within the beam, the shear of the moment, uh, and you've assigned all of the stress concentration factors along the length of the shaft, then you can calculate the minimum diameter from this equation. What you might notice is that we've got 2.94. What is that? Well, I'll explain that in a minute. I'll show you in the book where that is. But that's just a number. It doesn't have the units. KT is the stress concentration factor. And understand that we're going to apply this equation to many different points along the length of the shaft. That shaft that I passed around has several different diameters in it, right? It has several different features along the length. And the appropriate stress concentration factor depends on what features you have in that particular area, right? So we have to apply this equation not just once, but many times along the length of the shaft. Now, we don't apply it continuously along the length of the shaft, just in regions where the shaft is similar. Does that make sense? Where it has the same diameter and one, say, one or two stress concentration features. Now, this diameter will be calculated based on a couple of things. Number one that you would recognize or understand, at least, is this V. Anybody want to guess what V stands for? Think strength of materials. Shear. Shear. This is the shear force in that section of the shaft. N is a design factor. It's 
how sure you are about your, your design. And the more sure you are, the lower N can be. Usually we use N of about three or so. I think your author even says that. Uh, several cases discussed in Chapter 5 for competing design factors are useful. That's what I'm kind of looking for. Somewhere I'm pretty sure he says we use N equal to 3 most times. Um, but I don't remember where he put that. I'll find it later and point it out. Most of the time that's what I'm going to use. And then there's this SN prime. What the heck is that? Well, if we had been through gears by now, you would probably have a better feel for what this is. S is kind of like a stress. It's not exactly a stress. It's a strength. And in this case, this is called the modified endurance strength. You guys remember one of the labs we ran in uh, 211 in strength and materials where we put rods into the uh, machinery back there and let them rotate with the weight out on the end. So we we're applying a fatigue load. And we noted that the amount of load that the shaft could take, because it was just a thin, you know, what was it, 3 8 diameter shaft or so, the load it could take was much lower than its ultimate strength or even than its yield strength. We were not taking those rods past yield, and yet they failed within however many cycles, right? Yes? What was that? Uh, modified? Modified endurance strength. So the yield point and the ultimate strength don't really tell us a lot about how long it will take for the, the shaft to fail. In other words, what the strength of the shaft would be when it has a varying load on it. Now you might say, well, why would we have a varying load on the shaft? Well, the shaft, and that shaft rotates with machine elements on it. So you have a, a pulley on the end with a belt coming off of it. The direction of the belt force is going to remain constant. As the shaft rotates, the orientation of the shaft does not remain constant. Therefore, it looks like the belt load is changing direction. Does that make sense? So it's like you're bending the end of the shaft. So it is really legitimately a fatigue load. Many of the loads, most of the loads on shafting are fatigue type loads because the shaft rotates. So it's fully reverse bending stress most of the time. So this strength is something we'll have to come up with, which we'll, we'll do in chapter five. I'll show you the details of that when we get into an example problem. But there are some pages in chapter five of this book that you'll also want to tab so you can find it for the sake of chapter 12. But for right now, just understand that this is kind of like a fatigue strength. Okay? Now let's go back to the fact that we're looking at shear. We're calculating a required diameter of a shaft, which is basically a beam, based on the shear load in the beam. Does that seem wise or foolish? What do you think? Remember in strength of materials, I told you what always causes, well, usually causes failure in a beam is bending stress. bending stress. A moment, right? The bending stress comes from a moment load, not from a shear load. Well, it turns out this actually is not the most important equation. You need to use this when you need to calculate minimum diameters along the length of the shaft. You might want to make yourself a note. Let's go to page 461 where this equation is presented. It's equation 1216. You might put a note next to this and say, usually only important for the ends of the shaft. Because that's where this equation is going to really tell you the minimum diameters. See, at the ends of shafts, usually the moment is very low, and so the bending stress is very low. However, at the ends of shafts, the shear load can be fairly high, and so then this equation predicts a larger required diameter based on the shear load at the ends of shafts. There's actually a statement right under the equation. Oh, is it stated there? It says okay. this equation is primarily used when shear is the only significant loading present. Mm -hmm. Which happens near the ends of the shaft. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Here's the equation we really need. A little bit bigger. It's actually not as bad as it looks. Go over to page 463, and you'll notice this is equation 1224. Looks a lot like the equations preceding it, but honestly, the equations preceding it are pretty much useless. All we really need is 1224. And I'll explain what it is and what it's doing here in a moment. So 1224 and 12, what was it, 16? 1224 and 1216 are the important equations for sizing the shaft. The other equation is basically leading up. Now this equation assumes something. You notice there's no V in here. So it's assuming that shear is not significant. And actually, that is usually the case in a shaft. The largest loads are the bending moment, and therefore bending stress loads, and the torque. 
Remember, the purpose of the shaft is to transmit power. And the way it does that is not by transmitting a moment, but by transmitting a torque down the length of the shaft, down the axis. So you'll notice that the two loads listed here are a torque and a moment. Okay. Now you might look at this and say, OK, I, I see that that's a moment. I get that moments are what usually cause failure in shafts. If the shaft has a significant torque, I can see that somehow we need to include these two. Why are we doing this square root of the sum of squares vector looking thing? Well, the reason we're doing that is because basically this torque causes a shear load. Remember the shear profile that we saw in the strength of materials? Okay, so that's a different direction than the stress that the bending moment causes. The stress that the bending moment causes at right angles to it. That's why we're doing this square root of the sum of squares vector, vector addition in order to add those two together. So what we're really doing here is we're analyzing this as if it's combined stress, which that's what it is. Is combined stress. We're just neglecting one of the potential stresses, which is shear. Now, can you, let's see how much you remember from strength of materials. Why is it probably okay for this equation to calculate diameter based on moment and torque only and completely eliminate shear? Why would shear usually actually not appear? This is going to be greater. Distance is greater. What does that? Not distance. It is going to be greater. You're saying these are the important loads. Yes. I think that the effective load from shear would actually be zero. But why would that be? Why most of the time is that the case? Could it say cancel out? The shear no, no, cancel out. But the bending and the and the shear from torsion act at the outer fibers. Exactly. The max the, the bending stress caused by the moment is maximum at the outer diameter of the shaft. Same thing as the torque, right? But shear causes a profile that is maximum at the center and zero at the outside edges. So since that's the way shafts usually work, this is not such a bad, does that mean we'll always have zero shear at the surface? No, of course. It's possible. But even in the case where we have shear that is non-zero at the outer fibers, which is rare, it's small by comparison to these. Okay. So this is not perfect, but it'll get you pretty doggone close. And by the time you're done with this and you've gone up to basic sizes, you won't have to worry about the shear. You'll have plenty of excess to support the load. Notice that we even have a factor of safety here. 32 and pi are just numbers, but this would be our factor of safety of 3 or whatever we're going to use as in the last equation. Other than that, we have a stress concentration factor here for the moment, and we have a yield, not a yield strength, excuse me, we have an endurance strength here. So this is like a fatigue strength. And so what do you get when you take a ratio of two things? What are you really doing with a ratio? Aren't you comparing them? Say you want to make a trip from here to Indianapolis. You know it's about 100 miles, so you get 50 miles of that way out, of, you know, finished. You're 50 miles along the way. What would you say about your, your position? You're halfway there, right? You're making a comparison. The distance traveled over total distance is 50%, right? So this is making a comparison between the effect of the moment and the strength of the material in fatigue. Okay. The endurance strength. Or actually the modified endurance strength. So that's what this is doing. What is this term doing? Well, it's obviously comparing the torque to the yield strength. Wait, 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 wait. I thought you said that shafts have varying loads, so we should always compare it to an endurance strength. Why then are we comparing the torque in the shaft to a yield strength? The reason for this piece is that if you think about what a power transmission shaft is doing, one element is being driven and twisting the shaft. Right. Most of the time, the machinery we're talking about is machinery that operates pretty much at a steady state. It operates continuously. Okay. If that's the case, then we're continuously transmitting power down the shaft. But power is torque times speed. If the speed is constant, that means the torque is roughly constant. So the torque actually is not necessarily a fatigue load. And if we assumed it to be such, we would oversize the shaft excessively. We've already got a decent factor of safety here. So we'll compare the torque to the yield strength. Because basically the torque is pretty much constant. It's not a whole lot of variation. Now, if you knew that you were designing a shaft and the torque varied quite a lot, you probably ought to use S in prime here instead, right? Because that's the strength you have to compare it to. So, why is the three quarters there? I don't remember. You can dig into the book and figure it out. It's in the derivation somewhere. Uh, I think it has to do with the geometry, but I don't remember. The point is, here's the equation we need. This is a one-third power. Be careful, you have to take the square root first. 
And then after you multiply this through, then you take the one third power, and then this calculates the required diameter for each section. So what you have to do is go down the shaft and have a moment diagram, because the moment varies throughout the length of the shaft. Know what the torque is throughout the length of the shaft and calculate a required diameter at each section of the shaft. So we will apply both this equation and the last equation at several different points along the length of the shaft. Does that make sense? All right. That's it for chapter 12 in terms of lecture material. Now we actually have to get down to, to some work. I have to work some example problems. Any questions before we start? You don't want to put your book away. There's still quite a lot to learn about shaft design from the chapter and other things to highlight and so on. Uh, we're going to shut off the video now. It's obviously pre-recorded. You can go watch that. Even in these videos, I would describe the things you need to know. So we have quite a bit of work to do. It will take us more than just today to finish off these two. And really, these two are, if I remember right, it's continuation. Maybe not. Maybe, no, I take that back. I think they are two separate shaft problems. But still, all together, we've got two hours and 15 minutes worth of example problems. So let's see what we can do.